Either one, I don't think. There you go. Okay. So, um, So we were talking about uh, the Netflix web application, how uh, it's highly interactive, very smooth for the users to use, and the interactions and um, the transitions are very smooth. Traditionally, with web applications, it wasn't always the case. Um, you would, when you would click on a button or a link, there was a request that would be sent to the um, server, and the server would format its response, and it it would new up a new HTML page, and then that would be sent to the browser, which then would be displayed on the browser. So. All this, the whole request response cycle would take some time and there is some clunkiness attached to it. And then there is also latency because there is, it takes time for the request to be sent, the response to be formulated and sent down and the browser to interpret it and display it on the, on the screen for the users. So React or takes it all, and then not even React, JavaScript came into, um, um, happened. And then with JavaScript, JavaScript is a programming language that can be run on the browser. It runs logic on the browser and then it manipulates the DOM in a way that the users will see something totally different as if it was a new page when it's not actually a new page, when there was no request um, uh, that was sent to the server and no response that was received by the browser. So when JavaScript can do it, why, why do we need React? So uh, going back to our, uh, one of our earlier slides, we see that React is declarative. What does that mean? When you say that something is declarative, there certainly is something else that is not declarative. And what is that? That is imperative. So there is two styles of programming. One is declarative and one is imperative. With imperative programming, it is more about how you do something and declarative programming style on the other hand is more about what you do. So as far as English goes, the language, you, you, you think you understand it, but what exactly it is. So I will give you a real life um, metaphor for it. So a friend of mine is at a Walmart near um, in the same neighborhood as mine. And he calls me up says, and says, okay, I'm at this Walmart and I want to get to your place. How do I do it? So I can respond in one of two ways. My imperative response would be, okay, take the north exit out of the parking parking lot and then take a left, go two signals. Um, after two signals, take a, take a few rights, then a left, and then you'll be in our neighborhood and 298 is, my, is where I am. I could do it that way, or I could simply say my address is this, figure out. So when I say my address is 298 West Immutable Alley, et cetera, what I'm saying is I cannot be bothered by all the nitty-gritty details about what you do to get to my house, but just that I'll give you the address, you figure out a way. So it's it's up to my friend to, he will most likely employ um, GPS to get to my house, but I am not concerned with the low-level details of how he is getting to my house. So that is... Um, the difference between imperative and declarative approaches. So if you look at coming back to programming languages, HTML and SQL are two languages that are declarative. So when you look at these two examples, what strikes you is that you immediately understand what's happening there. You don't know and you don't want to care how it, things are being done, but you do know what's happening there. You know that you need uh, something displayed on, on your screen. There's a header and then something under the header that you want to display. You want that header to be bold and big and all that. But it, it's, it's up to HTML to figure out what, what elements in the DOM it's going to create, how it's going to create, what styles and font sizes it's going to apply for it to look like what we asked it to do. Um, and coming to SQL 2 here, we, we know that we are going to grab all users from Mexico from that um, table. We don't know how exactly SQL is going to go about it. Would it iterate the table, then look up the column, uh, compare it uh, and see that if it's uh, from Mexico and then put those um, tuples aside and then give you the... I, we are not concerned with all those nitty gritty details, but looking at it, we know what it's doing and we don't know how it's doing. So 
in a sense, declarative approach has a layer of abstraction, which is um, an imperative approach down. All that imperative implementation is abstracted away from you with a declarative approach. So yeah, we React as declarative, which is good. And if React is declarative and we want to use React, then most definitely JavaScript is lacking in that department. And JavaScript, coming to JavaScript, we know that it is a mix of imperative and declarative, which doesn't quite serve our purpose. So that's why we use React. Now, if you see these two examples side by side, there is a function to double the values of elements in an array. And function double does quite bad. So I would, it wouldn't be apparent to you immediately when you take a look at that. You will have to go read the code line by line for you to understand what it's doing. It's, it's all about the how there. Whereas on the right-hand side, the function double with um, the map function of JavaScript, you immediately know that, yes, there is an array that you're giving to that function and it returns the array, doubling the values of each of the elements in the array. Same with the at function. Here, you are iterating through every element in the array and then adding it to a value that you've initialized before you started iterating. And then finally you re return that result. Whereas at the reduce function here, you know that you give it an array and it initializes the initial sum at zero and then it just adds up and then gives it to you. So what you understand here is that all those low level details of how it's accomplishing that task are is hidden from you. It's easy to understand code and it's concise, less number of lines of code. And it's, it's easy to read and maintain and things like that. So that's one of the reasons why it's not JavaScript, but it's React that we use. And with React too, if we go back to the um, website um, Netflix, on Netflix, we see there is a card for each of those, each of the movies that they have streaming. Now, if you hover over a card, then you zoom in and then there's more detail there. You click on a button, then it starts playing. It's, it's very smooth, the transition from one, from one place to another or one um, component to another. Now, JavaScript can do that. So you can write up, um, you can create an element, put content in it, attach a button to it, um, add a click, um, event listener, and then you can add whatever that event listener needs to do and things like that. Okay, it does that, it's pretty smooth, it works and fine, but then there's 10 movies now that you need to add on the page. So you will have to repeat this code 10 times. Now, 10 is not so bad, but then if there's hundreds of them, then how do you do it? Your code will become pretty big, pretty quickly, and it's going to be a maintenance nightmare. And React is all about splitting your application into building blocks. These are called components. And these components, they have a clear task to do. And you can build your whole application using these, these blocks. And these, these blocks have, they are context independent too. They are, they are concerned about what to do, not how things are done. And that's why it can be applied to, it can be applied multiple times without um, much maintenance hassle. They're, it's easy to read and maintain and all that and all those nice things. So that's why we employ or we go for React. And React, coming to React, if we have to write our code in React, then we can do, do it in one of two ways. We can write functional components or class components. What are these and what's the differences? The one basic difference or the obvious difference between these two is the syntax. A functional component is just a plain JavaScript function that takes props as an argument and returns a React element or JSX. Um, JSX is nothing but a um, new version of JavaScript that lets, that lets you write HTML in React. Um, so it returns JSX. Now class component, class component has to extend um, uh, React component, and it has to implement the render method, which returns a React um, element or JSX. So if you see um, side by side, on the left-hand side, you see a functional component, and on the right-hand side, you see a class component. It's a simple function that takes in props and returns 
JSX. And on the right hand side, you have to extend React component and it, you have to implement the render method. Now, that is one major difference between a functional class and a functional component and a class component. And the next thing is state. So over here, you don't have the constructor method, but in a class component, you have a constructor method where you define your state. And because there is no constructor in a plain function, you don't have a state defined in your functional component. So basically functional components are stateless components. And uh, lifecycle hooks. With React component, there is a few lifecycle hooks that come, um, something like component will unmount, component will mount, component did update, did mount, and things like that. So those are not available in functional components. So why would I use functional components? So that's where you have, again, there is advantages to using components. As you saw, they are concise, it's fewer number of uh, lines of code, and it's, it's easier to understand. And there's a lot of boilerplate code that you would be eliminating if you were writing your code in functional components. Um, and then they help, um, help us use best practices. And then there is a performance boost aspect also to it. Now, these are all good things, but, but I can do any state management or lifecycle um, methods there because we are not extending React component. So that's where React hooks come into play. Now these were introduced in React 16.8 and React hooks bring to functional components all those things that you were otherwise able to do with class components um, using state and other React features. So you can essentially convert or write a functional component just as you would a class component, except you won't be extending it. Uh, you won't have a constructor, you won't have a random method, you won't have other lifecycle hooks, but React hooks help you fill in those gaps with a functional component. And as you've seen, there is, there is less number of uh, lines of code, it's easy to read and it's easy easily reusable and composable. And it also works better with React optimizations. When I say React optimizations, it's something like ahead of time compiling. Now with class components, you have, um, what do you call, um, methods. And they, they are, um, some of them are private, some of them are uh, public. So in order to do ahead of time compilation, you don't know where a method is being used. So that makes it difficult to get those optimizations in. And also with um, minification too, if it's a simple function, then it helps better with minification. So these are some of the advantages to using hooks um, with function components over class components. And with React hooks, there's a couple of rules that we need to follow. They always, uh, the hooks that come out of the box, they have use, the word use, um, they start with the word use and they're always used at the top level inside a functional component. And they can be used only in functional components, not in um, class components. And hooks, and there's another thing, we can write our own hooks and they're called custom hooks and hooks, React hooks can be used, can be used in custom hooks. And um, here are a few hooks that we have. The basic ones are use state, use effect, and use context. And there's an additional uh, few that are either variants of the ones that are that we uh, the, of the basic ones, and some that are nice to have and in increasing optimization and things like that. So let's jump to our first React hook. It's called use state. And what it does is it takes in an initial state and it returns an array of two elements. And the first element being the state of um, the state. And then the second one is a function that can update state. So what, um, now if you put a functional component side by side with a class component and then see how use state is used in a functional component to fill in the gaps that are created by not using the constructor is here. So in this component counter component, it's a simple component where when you, there's a button, you click on that button and then it records the number of times you've clicked it. And in the constructor here, we initialize our state. 
and we have a function that increments it and that function is called when you do an when you click on the button and that that function is the one that updates that update state here so coming to a functional component we have the button we click the button and what happens is initially when you then the when the component is rendered, we initialize the state with uh, the value zero. And it returns, and the, the syntax that you see here is nothing but array destructuring, where this function, when it returns two elements, those two elements, the first element is count, and the second element is of the array is this function set count. So this, initially, when the, when the component is rendered, whatever value that you use here is going to be the initial value of your state, which is count. And you could use whatever variable name that you want to here. It could be count, it, it could be um, ABC, it could be test, whatever it could be. And this, the, the name of this function could also be whatever you want it to be. Whereas here in the class component, the state is always this, I mean, this is the reference word that we use, um, but it always has to be state. And it always has to be an object. Here, it could be any prim primitive value, zero, um, a number, a string, an object, a list, um, anything. And here, your, the way you update state is always using this dot set state. You always have to use that. You cannot say set my, set my state or set test Nothing like that. Here, you could use whatever name that you want to use for your initial, um, for your variable and the function that updates the value of the variable. Let's um, look at an example here. So here I have a simple example, which is your state. Here is my component. It's a simple function that takes in props as an argument, but here I don't have any argument. Here is uh, my JSX, which is um, where I have something that says the number of times I've clicked the button and then the button. And here I have on click, I have this um, function that sets the state on, that increments the number of count that I have. So initially when I render the component, it's the value of it is zero. I have this open here. So initially, when I refresh the page, it's zero. When I click it, it updates the number. What's happening here is I update the number and then the component renders itself. So when the state changes, the component renders itself. And when it renders itself, then the count here is incremented. The incremented count is displayed. So that's how we use use state. And going back, uh, moving on to the next one. The next hook is use effect. What use effect does that is it accepts a function. So the background to this is when you, when you update state, you need things to happen. It could be uh, something that you update in the database or something that you subscribe to or uh, something that you store in a local storage or anything, any, anything that you see visually happen on the screen. Say uh, a button turns red, a button turns, or you see a model, things like that. These are side effects of something um, of the state changing or something. So when you use use effect, what it does is it takes a function and in that function, it, there is imperative code or low level code that, that, that does what you want it to do when state changes. Now, we'll come to this return function uh, in a bit, but side effects, anything that has to happen as a result of state change is handled by the use effect um, hook. Now, if you see an example right here, there is this component that initializes the state as um, the state count is zero. And then you have the button that displays and you click on that button and it updates the state. Now, the state, when it first, initially when you, when you render the component, you need to update the 
document title with the number of times the button has been clicked. And now after subsequent clicks on that button, that document title has to be updated. Now you do that using these lifecycle methods, which are component did mount. Component did mount will run once after the initial render of the component. Now component did update would run after subsequent re-renders of the component. Now to, to get the same effect on a functional component, you have the state. And now when state updates, you have this effect. This would run every time when the component renders. The first time, subsequent times, it doesn't matter. It runs and then this takes in a function and this function is ex executed, which is updating the document title with the number of times that um, has been clicked. So if you go, I have So I have the use effect component running here. If I hover on that tab, you will see that whatever document title was updated with, it says you clicked zero times. Now I click once, twice, thrice. Every time I do that, now this, this updates um, the document title. Now, one thing to notice here is that with use effect, if I say, this should run if I use effect takes a function and it also takes an array of dependencies. If you don't give it the array of dependencies, it would run every time the component is rendered. So that's what you see here. Every time I clicked it, it would update it. But what I did here was I introduced an array, which is an empty array. So I don't give it any dependencies. So in that case, what it does is it runs just the once when the component is initially rendered. After that, it won't render. It won't, it won't run. So that's what's happening here. I click it multiple times because there is no list of dependencies that I gave it. It would just run it the first time and then not run it on subsequent re-renders. So what I do is I want it to run every time the count is updated. So this function is dependent on count and when it changes is when it renders every time. So as you see, every time I click it, the value of the state changes. And when the state changes, this side effect is run, is executed. And you see the document title is updated. So that's use effect. And moving on, the next one is use context. So now we have what I showed you right now just now was just a, a simple component. So it's always not going to be the case in uh, real world um, scenarios, you would have a whole component tree wherein there is a parent component and then child components underneath it. And that could be uh, many levels deep. So in that case, um, how do you share context between all these components? One way to do that is by passing those uh, values in props. And it's called props drilling, where the parent would have the, the, the value and then it'll give it to the component by means of, um, so if you have something like a component here and you're using that component, you would say something like value here. And then this component, if it was using another component inside of it, then you would give, you would transfer that um, value to, to its child component and things like that. So the, those are props that you pass from one component to another to share context. Now, it becomes tedious and very cumbersome to be doing that um, everywhere where you need that context to be transferred. So it would be nice if you had the context somewhere in a common place where all these components can tap into. So if you, uh, for example, if we are a company and then if an employee wanted to take a look at say um, the employee handbook, 
and he doesn't have access to it. So what he does is he will check with the with his manager saying that, okay, I need um, to see what this handbook looks like. And then the manager doesn't have it. So the manager will have to check with um, the city manager and then the city manager doesn't have it either. So he'll have to check with the CEO. And then the CEO, if he has access to it, he will provide it to the senior manager. The senior manager will provide that document to the manager and then the manager to the employee. So it has to travel down so many levels. Instead of doing that, there could be a common place, maybe a wiki where this is posted. So whenever the employee wants to take a look at it, he can go to the wiki, get it, independent of going through all these um, um, levels. And if the um, senior manager wants to take a look at it, then he can go to wiki and get it too. So use a, uh, use a context is something like is something like that, where you could go to a common place where this context is uh, present and shared, and you can grab values, whatever you want. So So what it does is it use context takes in um, a context and that context is nothing but a context object that is returned by react.createContext. You would create a context and that context object is one that is used by use context and it will return a value that will be used in the component. So let's take a look at um, the example here. Um, so what I have here is what I have here is a profile, an employee profile. Now, now this profile, what this component does is it includes the company name, and after that, it has the user component. Now, going back to the user component, what it does is it has details about the user, username and full name, and the team that he belongs to, he or she belongs to, and the team component has some um, details about the team, what team the user or the employee belongs to, and there is also a component called change team. And what does that do? The, the change team component has three buttons, clicking on which you would um, switch the team of the user to that particular um, team and you would display that. Now, there is a chain of components here and all of these, now the profile, and here is my profile context where I have all the information about the user saved here. I have the company information, username, full name, team, etc. Now, my profile here, it only wants the company name and the user down below, it wants the username and full name. So I could use props drilling by just passing this information down from the, the topmost parent to every child underneath. But what I do is I have this context and there is a provider. This provider has to be, this provider has to wrap the parent element in it and whatever child is under that parent component, they would have access to that particular context, which is the profile context uh, in the example that we have. So over here, My, my team is, or my profile is this, that this is my company, my name, my username, full name, and the team that I belong to. Now, if I click this button over here, I switched teams, I switched teams with Deltec. And if I click this, I, so now all that is in one central location. All that information is here in my user information object. And provider is the one that provides context to that provides a handle to that information by means of this prop, which is a value, and that is passed down, that information is passed down to all the children that are wrapped inside this provider component. So that's how you use, use context. And the next one, 
is use reducer. Use reducer is a variant of the use state React hook. Now, if you have a single state um, value, then you will use use state. And then if there is two or three of them. Say if you have a form that has first name, last name, email address, then you could have what use state for each one of those for first name, last name, and email address. And there are sometimes there are complex states where there are multiple sub values and all of them, they either have they either depend on each other or in some way related to previous state. So in that case, it's easier if you used a use red user where the use red user is a React hook that takes in a red user function. A red user function is nothing but um, a function where it takes in the previous state and then an action. This action is triggered when, and then use red user, it takes an initial state and an initial function too. It takes in, you could either initialize the state of um, the state in initial state, or you can programmatically do it using a function too. And when it takes in these, it returns, again, this is array destructuring over here, it returns the current state. And then the next element would be a function, a function that can be used um, to dispatch a new action. So let's see an example, because this is a little complicated to understand. Um, going to okay I let me comment out this and then so I have my component here what I have is I have two buttons I have uh, an increment and a decrement. So both these buttons, they act on the user state, which is the number of times I've um, clicked. When you click on increment, oh, it's not the number of times, it's just that if you click on the increment button, the value of the counter increases, and if you click on the decrement button, it decrements. So going to the example. So initially you start out with value zero. So that is the initial state. The initial state here is zero. And you give it the red user function. The red user function has to be of this format where it takes the state and then there is an action to it. And then that action defines what's gonna happen to state. And this user, user red user function or React hook, it gives you the state, the updated state, and then the dispatch function. Dispatch function is the one that you use with what, what action type that you need to take in order to update state. Now here, if I increment it, the value goes up. And when I do this, it, the value goes down. So if I were to use use state, then there would be there would be, because it's one variable that I am changing the state on, there would be use state and then there is set um, count. And in that set count, I have to distinguish if it was the increment button that was clicked or a decrement button that was kicked, clicked. Um, use red user makes it easy if there is complicated state to manage. And I think I also have, um, Another example, if I can find it, we use red user. Um, I, I think it's for callback, but yeah. Any questions right here? So, so Sherlock, you could use um, use state, but this is a but you'd have to have multiple functions for the increment and decrement. Right. That generally, the idea here. Okay. Yes. So this is one, it lets you, um, it, lets, it lets you manage or manage state that is a little complex where there is multiple values or multiple sub values. And all these values are kind of interlinked. Sometimes you would have um, say username and then maybe even logged in or logged out the, the status of the user, which they go hand in hand and 
they are somewhat related. So in that case, it's much better instead of having independent use state um, hooks for each of these uh, to manage each of these values, we could use user reducer and we could have one place where we know what's happening um, to this complex state and how it's changing. Okay, makes sense. Um, And then the next one is use ref. What use ref does is it takes in an initial value and then it returns an object, um, a reference object whose current property is initially um, is initially the initial value that you pass. But then it's tied to um, say if you used React ref with a node. Um, on your React element, what React does is it ties it to that element. And when that element changes on the DOM, it applies or it sets the current property of that reference object with whatever value that the node has. So it's easier if you take a look at um, an example. And here is one. So here what I'm doing is I have an input um, element here. And I'm using use ref and I initialize its value with um, empty string. And I call it, this is my input ref object. And input ref, op, input ref object has a current dot current property that is tied to this node. So whenever there is some text that changes here, React automatically assigns that to this input ref object. We'll see that in action here. That would be So if you see here, as I cl click it, this is displayed here. So whatever value that I have in my text ref. So on click, what I'm doing is I have this um, function that runs and displays uh, my value. So as I keep typing into it, React takes care of putting that value into this, into the current property of our reference object. So it's nothing but um, just like how you would um, reference an object, you could um, just refer to it using the word ref here and then tie it to our, um, to the reference or the mutable object that use ref gives us. So that is about use ref and um, use callback. This is one of the important ones. Um, so we have use callback. What it does is, is it memo, memoizes callbacks. What it means is, what is memoization? Memoization is an optimization technique that is used to speed computer programs by storing the results of a really expensive function um, function and returns this cached value when when things um, when when it's called with the same inputs. So if there is a function and there is a few inputs to it, every time you call the function, it's going to execute it, which is going to be costly. And if it's costly, you're better off saving the result of that function somewhere. And then whenever it's called, instead of running that function right then and giving you the result, you give the result from the cache location, 
that you have. So that is what memoization is. And why do we have to use this, this um, hook? Let's see an example. Um, here is where I have, okay. Let me comment this out. So here is my team. So right now I'm only I'm the only one on my team. And as I type more people into it, um, it'll keep updating this list. And the way I have structured my components is um, I have my team here, wherein I have, you could type a new member and then there is a button to handle the new addition. And we have a list component here that displays existing users. And the list component is like so where list is an array of um, people and it iterates through each of those and then uses list item to do the actual display of that particular user. And next to that user is a button that says remove. So if I hit this, that user is removed. Now, if, if you see, if I refresh this, initially my team component is um, rendered. And then because list is a component within my component, within my team, that is rendered. And because list item is another component within the list component, all three components are rendered. Now I start typing into it. So what's happening? Um, my team is rendered every time I type into it. If I look into my team, So I have already used use callback, so I won't use that. Um, we have, we are passing users to the list component and then also this function, which is the handle remove function. As I start typing into it, every time I type into it, I'm not adding any user to my list. So why is the list getting executed? And then the list item, which is the actual display of the members in the team. Why are they getting rendered all the time? Why are they? Why are those comp components rendering all the time? Here I have on change. As as I keep typing, there is this handle text that gets executed, and here is where the state changes. And we know that whenever state changes, the component re-renders. Re so it makes sense that my team, this component is getting rendered, but there's nothing on this component users, there's no change to users, but there's no change to handle remove also. But is that true? Users has no change, but handle remove, if you see, whenever this component re-renders, it re-renders everything inside that component. And handle remove is a function. Now it may be the same as before, there's no change in it, but it's redefined, it's, it's a new object. It's a new function. So because this is changed, list is also list is also rendered. And because list is rendered, the same thing with because we have on remove getting passed down to list item two, that renders. But we don't want list component and list item components to render themselves. We just want when when there's no changes as such, when there's no user, we don't want them re-rendering. So what we do is we use callback. So we wrap this um, function, we use callback. So this memoizes this function in the sense that it makes a copy of it unless its dependencies or anything that is used within the function is changed, it is going to return the same function every time, even on re-renders. So that's why there's no change to it unless there is change to users, in which case it makes sense that it gives you a newly refined, a redefined uh, function that is used to render your the new list of users. If you look at the component now, it still is rendering all those Components, what's, so what's wrong? Oh, I did not save it. Let me save it. And now if you see, it's only the team that is getting rendered. Now, if I click on add user, that's when the list is rendered and list item is rendered twice because it's 
one rendering for each um, user that you have. And now if you remove it, you will see that my team, because there's change in the number of users, the list has to render itself and also the list item. So that's how you use use callback. Use callback is used on functions. Um, and let's see the next. Sri Lata, I just want to let you know we have a few minutes left. Yeah, I'm sorry. Right, I'll hurry okay. through these. <laughs> And use memo is nothing but um, this is used in value. So there's if there is expensive computations that you need to do, um, then that computation value is saved, and then that is returned every time instead of performing those expensive calculations. It's it's just that you would use this on a value as opposed to a function. Um, I have an example for that too, but. Um, it's, it's quite similar to callback. And then custom hooks. So now these are hooks that are provided by React and we have custom hooks too. So what is a custom hook? It's again, a JavaScript function, just like um, the functional components that we have. They can use other hooks. And then if there is any common logic or state that, that is used across multiple components, what you can do is instead of repeating that common logic in each of these components, you can extract that out create a custom hook out of it and use that custom hook in each of these components. So that makes it really uh, reusable, uh, easy to maintain, because if there's any change to it, you change it one place, it takes effect in multiple places and things like that. Um, I have a small example um, for it, which is custom hook, yeah. Quickly. So if I click here, the, the, the document title changes. Now, if I have to do that with a couple other components too, what I can do is, so my document title, what it does is whatever title that it gets, it just um, assigns to document title. So this is this is all it does, the use document title. And now if I were to use it here, I could do a use effect. And then whenever title changes, you could say, okay, my document title is now title. I could do that. Or if I have to do that in multiple components, again, this is very simple. There could be complex um, things too that you want to do. You don't want to repeat that code in every component. So what you do is you just make use of this um, custom hook that you've written. And all you do is you give it the title and it takes care of the display. Um, that's about custom hooks and custom hooks are, again, it follows the same. They have to start with the, uh, with the word use and that is, um, and it's on the custom hook, all the regular rules that uh, need to be followed by React hooks will then apply to your custom hook too, that it has to be used at the top level only, only in functional components, not in any loops or if box and not in um, class components and things like that. Now, Functional components are good. That's the way to go is what they are saying, but we have class components also in our code and it's a huge code base. Now, how do you make the conversion from class components to function components? It's easy. 99% um, of the times, whatever code that you have in your class components can be ported or converted to a functional component. All you do is change the declaration of your component from class to function, remove the random method, remove references to this, and then um, you all your life cycle methods will now become hooks and things like that. But there are a few things that cannot be done. There's no, there's still challenges with conversion. The challenges are say, most of the time you have state defined in your constructor, but then sometimes you will have something that's besides state. So in that case, there is no hook to replace your constructor. So how do you go about handling that? Because constructor runs once when the component is first initialized and after that on re-renders, the constructor doesn't run. So how there is no hook right now that just runs at the time when the component is initialized and not after. And there is, if you have to extend component to, um, get inherent behavior from the parent component, you can't quite do that with functional components. And there are some lifecycle hooks that cannot, that don't have lifecycle methods that don't have um, corresponding or appropriate hooks. Um, and then of course, higher order components, it's not quite as easy to do that with functional components. And then if you have a combined state, when you, you know that you can run an effect when, if you give a list of dependencies, then anything in that list changes, the effect is run. But if you want to run the effect when 
you know, a combination of those happen. Say like if A and B change, not A independently or B independently, but A and B, then they both change, you'll have to run an effect. How do you do that? Right now we don't have a hook. So there is a couple of challenges with conversion there, but um, for the most part, if you have um, your legacy code base where it's all class components, converting them to function components for the most part is pretty easy. Um, and they both can exist um, together. So we don't have to hurry up and make that conversion happen unless React um, withdraws support to class components anytime soon, if, if they do it. But otherwise, for, for the time being or um, for the near term, they could both exist um, in the same code base. So that's all about React hooks. Do you guys have any questions? I know we, we went over time, but um, I apologize. And if you have any questions, um, yeah, we, we can talk about them. If you guys don't have any questions, then that is all. Thank you guys for taking the time and um, attending this session. Thank you, Sri Lata. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all. Bye. Thank